Okay. So, um, as Monshin Sensei kindly introduced me, uh, I'm doing the part two on, on karma. Um, so for those who don't know, like I'm, my name is Maxim. I'm currently doing my PhD working on translating classical Japanese Buddhist texts. And uh, this is kind of like just all this different stuff that I've incarnated of karma from different authors, different perspective, and my own understanding through reading the sutras and stuff kind of all bundled up together uh, to try to present in a somewhat coherent way. I think today's going to feel a little less coherent than the first time because uh, I wasn't able to put in as much time into the presentation. So please be uh, bear with me on, on this point. Um so last time was the focus was kind of like on the like individual when you think about like the karma the individual how you kind of inherit it how you produce some the, the actor all that kind of stuff and today is more about the other side of things like how it's going to be geared towards others and how these kind of interactions happen um so today's presentation we are going to i'm going to do just a really quick recap of what happened like to kind of just refresh the memory a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about some of the uniqueness of karmic theory in comparison to other theories that were out there presented, you know, like ancient theories of, of the world. Then I'm going to talk about the karma of the three periods or karma of the three times, uh, which, you know, we're going to talk about that uh, as we get there. Then faith and karma. In this particular thing, I'm just going to talk about a story that I've encountered in my, uh, in my readings. Um, and that story engages specifically with the kind of question that I feel some of us has probably juggled at some point in our on our journey of why is it that some people do bad action and receive good things while other people do good actions and receive bad things and the kind of unfairness about that. So uh, there is a, a story, scriptural story about that that I'm going to share. And at the conclusion, it's looking at this interaction between karma and, and like the focus on others allows us to really kind of understand like almost logically, oh, like if that's the way things work, then it makes sense that compassion would be the, the approach to life uh, that is promoted by Buddhists uh, in general. So, so that's kind of the goal for today. So the first part, the recap, again, I'm going to skim through this uh, quicker, quicker than probably would be necessary. But if anything, at some point, you know, the video is going to be on YouTube. Thanks to Jake. Always, you do amazing work. And uh, at some point, you'll be able to just see it there to refresh the memory, I guess. Um, So karma is not, we tend to translate it as like action. It's not just action. It's the totality of what encompasses to act. Uh, we looked at the etymology of that. So it's not just the action. It's also the actor, the place of the actor, the circumstances, the, the cause, the effect, and all that kind of stuff. So this, all of this is what is encompassed by the term karma. Then we talked about the relationship between dependent co-origination and karma and rebirth. That karma, it's not just the immediate kind of like before and after of an action. It's the totality of the web of cause and effect that extends like to and kind of like unlimited past and an unlimited future um, almost. And rebirth is a thing and birth is a thing that happens at every step of the process. It's not limited to birth in terms of organic beings that are just born into the world. So the way that I talked about it in the presentation was like, you know, the birth of a cause gives the birth to an action that gives the birth to a result that births at another cause that births a result that births a, you know so it's like birth is a thing that happens every single step of the process um it's not just like an organic being being born we also talked about how uh, there is no nature essence or soul that is transferred through karmic processes a thing simply inherits the the energy of past actions and will transfer this errated energy through their actions, if not purified. So uh, the, the way I talked about it was like beard, beard balls, you know, of like when you hit one, it hits the, the ball, and then this ball moves forward. The identity of ball one doesn't transfer over to ball two. You The ball two just inherits whatever kind of came with ball one and just moves along. So uh, it's a complete different ball that moves forward, um, you know, but the energy gets transferred over. It's, uh, it's not a perfect 
metaphor, but I think that's a that's a good way to explain how this process of transferring can happen without necessity for like a soul or an essence to be there in the process. And with all of that, we kind of concluded that uh, we are not responsible for the karma that we inherit, but we are responsible for the karma that we produce to send forward into the future. So that was part one, really focusing on the individual, the way you receive, the way you produce, what, what's kind of in it for, for, for you, um, and all that kind of stuff. Today, we're shifting away towards the, the others. So first of all, I want to talk about uh, kind of two points, I guess, of karmic theory. Um, the first one is I touched upon it in the in the question segment of the first presentation because I did say that I would talk about this this time. Is one of the uniqueness of karmic theory is that, and if someone has different understanding, also please correct me. But it's pretty much one of the only ancient theory that I know of. So that's the that I know of is the important part. Keep that in mind. That does not require a primordial mover or a doer. So what we what I mean by that is that uh, in either Vedic traditions, there's you know like deities, there's also cosmic energy like Shakti or uh, essence, soul with Atman. You have you know God in the Abrahamic traditions. You have Tao in China or Qi that are playing that kind of part. Chaos in Greece. All these kind of stuff is is try to explain that. How is it that things come into being? You know, talking about birth, rebirth. How is it that things come into being, come into manifest into into the world? And there, in most ancient theories, uh, posited that there is a kind of there's someone or a, a doer, a mover that kind of like gets that process going. So it's either some kind of like energy that goes in that makes make things move forward or make things appear. Uh, in American First Nations, there's like the Gichi Manitu, the the great spirit that is you know starting the cycle, uh, you know the the what's it called like the uh, origin stories kind of thing. So there's oftentimes a something that starts it. You know, it starts the process, it makes it going, it makes things appear, and manifest, and interact, and whichever form it takes, there's always a kind of a, a mover, like a doer that's primordially there before behind all things. But in karmic theory, in the the um, dependent co-origination, there is no mover behind things. It's only when the proper conditions are there, things manifest. And they manifest containing the energies, you know, like the, the karma like, uh, of the past and all that kind of stuff. But it's not like a thing that makes it happen. It just happens because the conditions are there for it to happen. So it's a it's the only theory again ancient theory that I know of that doesn't have the primordial mover and it's a very unique feature of, of karmic theory, uh, but it also becomes key to understanding another aspect of the uniqueness of karmic theory directly in relation to that is that the birth of anything happens because of the necessary connection between the cause and the effect, so it doesn't require an actor. Which is kind of weird, right? Because we think about karma, it's about action, right? So if we talk about karma and it's about actions or stuff that relates to action, but then we say that it doesn't require an actor, but only conditions for things to happen, that just gets very confusing. And part of what I'm trying to do in this presentation is to very much clarify that point. Uh, and the analogy that I like to use, it's one that's used in the Buddhist texts as well, in the sutras. So I, I like to use that one too, because it's related to probably most of you know that analogy. It's like, you know, planting a seed and it becomes like a tree or a fruit and all that kind of stuff. So if we think about, you know, like doing an action in the sense of like planting a seed, right? So there's a seed that is being planted, but the seed that is being planted doesn't have to be planted by an actor, right? Like I can choose to take a seed and plant it. And that would be like an action that I pose. But a seed could also fall from a tree and just land on the soil and then gets planted on its own. And then things happen and it grows into a tree. So there can be an actor doing the action, but the seed can be planted even if the actor is not there. Uh, but in order for the, the seed to become a tree and then to become a fruit and all that kind of stuff, 
it's not a primordial mover or an actor that moves the process forward. It's just a matter of like, are the proper conditions there for the seed to become a tree and to become a fruit? So in this case, you know, it needs the sun, it needs water, it needs good soil that has the proper minerals. It has, you know, needs to have oxygen, all these kind of stuff, right? So all the conditions need to be there. And when the conditions are there, then that process happens and the, the seed becomes a fruit and then the fruit gets to be eaten and 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 uh, like everybody's happy because they're eating good fruits. So the the role of the actor in this process is the thing that's, again, unique to, to karmic theory. And it's also very important to distinguish with the way we kind of generally understand uh, karma is that as an actor, you can play a role in every single step of that process, right? You can plant the seed you can't water the seed you can if you want kind of like have a system to direct the sunlight at the plant like to the right amount that it needs in order to have exactly the right conditions you can fertilize your ground to make sure it has the proper nutrients to be able to move forward so the actor's role is kind of like helping the process moving forward by making sure that the proper conditions are there but even if the actor is not there, these conditions might still be there and uh, the plant might still grow, the seed might still grow into the tree. Or also, if there's a plant that's been, a seed that's been planted, you know, 60 years ago and the person passed away, you as an actor might come in into the third part of the process, which is, I don't know, like watering the plant or something to make it become grow. So you can start at any point of the process and the actions that you pose matter. It matter into making sure that the right conditions are there for the, the proper outcomes to happen. So this is going to be the crux of a lot of what this presentation is about, is the role of the actor like karma, like the actions and the actor within the context of understanding that the actor is not necessary, but it's also very important in karmic theory. So next thing I want to talk about is the what they call the karma of the, the, the three periods. It's I'm not going to spend too much time on on this, but I'm I want to give people the I guess like the vocabulary, like you know the the Japanese, the the Sanskrit, and all these stuff to to go about what that means. So specifically, what is meant by the karma of the three periods is there's three different types of karma that manifests at kind of different periods of time. So you have the karma to be made known in the currently existing dharmas, um, which is the terms that you're seeing. Uh, and a being will experience the result of their action. Oh, sorry. It's supposed to be actions, not actions uh, in their present lifetime. So that means you, you, there's an action that's done and the retributions, like the result of the action happens within the actor's lifetime. But there is also karma to be made known in the upcoming birth, which is the fact that a being will experience the result of their actions in their immediate next lifetime. So, a person does an action in this lifetime and the result of the action fructify in the next birth. And also, there is a karma to be made known after the next lapse. So experience the result of their action in this current lifetime, the next one and or multiple ones after that. So this one is a little more ambiguous. You can have like you do an action in this life. And there's a chance that the results of your actions might be happening this lifetime and the next one and all ones after. Normally, the beings that are able to do this are, are bodhisattvas, that their actions have repercussions to each of different steps of the process. But this it also means that you can do an action in this life and the repercussions, the result of this action is going to manifest in like 100 lifetimes later. So... Why is this important specifically to understanding the connections between uh, karma not necessitating an actor and the role that it plays with conditions? Is that ultimately the initial actor is not entitled to the results of their actions. And what I mean by this is that a fruit is going to come into being whenever the proper conditions are met. There is no knowledge or guarantee when or how this will happen. Unless you're a Buddha of Bodhisattvas, because they're able to understand the, the sea 
the the karmic connections and understand the the repercussions of the past and the future and all that kind of stuff. But if you are, uh, I guess, a, a regular being that is not a, an enlightened being such as the Buddha Bodhisattva, you're not able to understand that. So you pose an action and you don't know if there is no guarantee that this action is going to have repercussions in this life, in the next life, or, or anyone after that. So you're not entitled to the results of their action to be like, hey, I did something good. That means that I'm going to have something good happen to me like in this life. It it might not be the case. It might be that someone that's going to enter it, your energy 50 years from now is going to be the one inheriting that, but not necessarily you in this lifetime. So that shifts the story about how karma works and it shifts the focus away from the individual of like, I do something good because I want the good things to happen back to myself in this life. Um, the framework doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen. There's a chance it's going to happen. It's one of the three different types of karma, but it's not the only one. So now it's story time. So bringing faith into this is the part that is uh, important and relevant. So I'm going to share a story that's, uh, it's, there's no, I haven't encountered a particular name for that story. It just talks about two monks that are in Shravasti in, in uh, India. Uh, in the past, it's one of the places that the Buddha taught. I think there's a story that he, he, he was like flying in this area and something around that. But anyway, um, so the story is, I'm really paraphrasing the thing. So please bear with me. Like I would encourage people to go read the story for themselves. Um, the story basically says um, there's two people that are kind of on their deathbeds and one person, their entire life as only done good actions, only done good actions, uh, like exemplary life. And when they're in this passage from life to death, they see and they know that, oh, I'm going to be reborn in one of the hells in my next life. And then there's the thought, right, that raises of like, how come is it? How come is it that I did so many good things but I'm going to still be reborn in hell. Like, how does that work? And on the flip side, the other person that's on the deathbed is uh, like lived, you know, bad life, like no, no good actions, like the exact opposite. And when they see what's about to happen is they're going to be reborn in a, uh, in one of the, like the Deva heavens. Um, and then there's this kind of question of like, oh, like what's going to happen? Uh, why is it that it is the case? So what ends up happening is that the first monk that did only good action but gets to be reborn in hell is very, very, very joyful. And they're very joyful because they understand, they have faith, they understand the reality of karmic processes, and they understand that, okay, I did very, very good in my lifetime, maybe in, my, in the next life that's going to inherit something, like the next rebirth is going to be reborn in hell. But that's okay. And that's okay because I know that the good actions that I pose in this life, at some point, it's going to reap good things. I might not be the one being able to get them, but at some point, my good actions are going to, someone is going to, someone or something is going to inherit that and is going to do very good for the world. And I am very happy and proud and joyful about knowing that my good actions are going to go there, are going to have that kind of impact. And in the story, having that faith into the karmic processes, really understanding that karma has th that way of operating actually makes that person be reborn in heaven instead of going to hell. So faith in understanding really truly how karma works is a thing that kind of clears off the the karmic inheritance and allows all of the goodness that was done in the lifetime to kind of kick in in this moment while purifying the past and therefore allows to be reborn in heaven and the you can guess that the opposite happens to the other monk so that that person was kind of like oh Karma is nonsense. Look at that. I did bad all of my life, but I'm still going to be reborn in heaven. So like that's, you know, like that just proves that karma is BS. Like it's nonsense, uh, you know, so that's, you know, like complete non-faith in the 
in 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 the process, not understanding at all how kind of karma really works. And that person, instead of being reborn in heaven, gets to be reborn in, in hell because that like not that amount of ignorance into karmic processes is just fostering so much kind of like uh you know negative stuff that it takes away all kind of the good stuff and it just dumps the person in hell. So that's the story in a nutshell. So what is it about that story that's important to remember? So it tackles the question of why is it that people do bad actions and receive good results and some people do good actions, receive bad results? Well, basically the answer is found in dependent coorigination, right? So what are the current conditions? So what kind of soil is there? If you we continue using the soil and seed and tree analogy, what are the kinds of retributions that can manifest within the current conditions? What kind of fruits can grow out of this soil? So what do we mean by this is that like a person can do a lot of really good actions. You can plant so many good seeds, but if the soil is not good, your seeds are not going to grow. If you plant a lot of good seeds, but your seeds are never watered and they don't have sun, they're not going to grow. Your seeds are going to stay planted and they're going to grow when the proper conditions are there. So in the case of the monks, you could imagine that, for example, there's particular conditions at play, like at the moment of death, for example, of the first monk to be like, okay, like I did a lot of good actions in this life, but in my present moment, I'm in the conditions that are like bad conditions that might have been created 50 lifetimes ago or my last life, I don't know. But right now it's like the, the karma that's kicking in is a bad karma from the past that I've inherited. So it sucks because I'm doing so many good, but I'm in the in a place where the conditions doesn't allow for the good things to happen. But having faith in karma and understanding how it works, I can still be very happy and proud and joyful because I know that all of the good seeds that I planted in this life, whenever the conditions are going to be there, they are going to grow into amazing trees and fruits that everybody can enjoy. So it's focusing away from just the individual process and understand that it's the conditions that matter and the role that you can play in being joyful in knowing that you've participated in helping creating these conditions or planting the seeds that when the conditions are going to be there, they're going to be enjoyed and probably not by you, like as a, as you, your own identity, maybe by the energy that's going to send forward, but not by you, you know, like me, like Maxim right now. Secondly, bringing the karma, the three periods and what I said is that we might be doing everything right in this lifetime, but the conditions might not be proper for these seeds to blossom in this current lifetime. It might be, you know, it might happen in the next one and down the line, it might happen every single one if, you know, the conditions are really good. So having faith in karmic principle and faith is kind of like, you know, uh, Munchin Sensei explained it very nicely. It's like having faith is like, even if you don't understand, you can still kind of like know that it's true and uh, live by that truth without necessarily understanding all the intricacies of it. So having understanding or faith in karmic principles allows us to have joy in knowing that whenever the right conditions are going to be present, our seeds will become great fruits to be enjoyed by all and probably not by us. So just checking out time. Okay. So in conclusion, what I wanted to really emphasize in this presentation is that karma and dependent coorigination, so Engiyas Pratitya Samutpada, it de-emphasizes the role of the actor and rather it emphasizes conditions. So the actor is not just responsible for doing wholesome actions, right? All of us individually we're not just responsible for doing good actions like planting good seeds ourselves. Actors like ourselves are also responsible for helping and fostering the proper conditions where all awesome actions can manifest, which means watering, fertilizing, directing the light on seeds of others, like the stuff that I talked about earlier. So 
it's not enough to just focus on I'm doing good. Because the thing is, other people are planting good seeds everywhere. And if you play a role in watering all of these seeds, even though they might not be yours, like if you play a role in watering all these seeds, you're, you're helping in fostering the proper conditions. And the more of these proper conditions are there, the more all of these good seeds are going to flourish. And that's the role that is very important. That is the role of the actor. You can't plant the seeds yourself, but you can't make the thing grow. You can just help in making sure the conditions are there for it to grow, which is something that all of us can do. And the more people are doing it, the more conditions are proper for the good seeds, the good karma to be able to flourish. And again, just emphasizing the last point is that an actor is not entitled to the results of their action. So this is why our action should always be aimed towards others. And this is where compassion comes in, right? It's not just about like, I'm doing good actions for myself because I know that in this life, I'm going to like reap the benefits of my action. Actually, it's like in a lot of like the sutras and karmic theory, like oftentimes you do good actions now, but you're you're not going to be the one that benefits from your good actions. Uh, you don't really, you're not entitled to the results of your action. So you do good actions knowing that it's going to benefit others when the conditions are going to be right. Or you you do actions in the present to help foster the good conditions because you know that it helps the seed of others to sprout and then everybody gets the benefit. So it shifts the focus from the individual towards others. And that's where compassion comes in and is very essential and important. So in that sense, joy, just restating what I said earlier, joy is gained from understanding the truth of karmic processes and knowing that your wholesome action will at some point benefit others. One day, someone will eat the good fruits of the seed that you planted. And that is the crux of the matter and why, again, compassion and all that stuff is so important is you doing something knowing very well that you might not be the one that is going to benefit, but it is going to benefit others when the conditions are going to be there. And you also have responsibility to do what you can to make sure that the conditions are there so that all the seeds that have been planted by yourself and others in multiple different moments have a better chance of blossoming so that everybody can benefit. And the way that I'm talking about it, I'm focusing on like the, the good, you know, like the, the good karma, the good seeds, but that you can just reapply it the other way around for like the bad seeds and bad karma and bad action, right? Like if you do bad actions, you're planting bad seeds or like there might be good seeds, you know, very good, healthy seeds of goodness. But if the soil is poisoned and the, the, the water is disgusting and the sun is like, you know, like uh, clouded or something like, I don't know, then it's like, the conditions are not there for the good seeds to grow and they might grow into a fruit, but the fruit is going to be poisonous and then we're all going to eat it. You know, it's like you can take the analogy and just flip it around to the like the the bad actions as well. Um, but the principle remains the same, regardless if you think about the good actions or the bad actions. So that basically is my presentation for today. So I feel like I was a lot more rambly today than I than I normally am, but uh, I think that opens maybe the the room for more questions and clarification that I hope I will be able to to help in figuring out. And Ichishima Sensei, do you have anything that you would like to add to Maxime's presentation, which was a, a an excellent presentation? Okay, uh, there are three types of attaining Buddhahood. Uh, that is uh, Sango Jobs, uh, the four, you know, uh, Sango is a uh, three karmic uh, ages, you know, uh, that like a Shravaka, Pratyeka Buddhas try to be a Buddha by training for long, long times, but it's very difficult to attain Buddhahood. That is uh, uh, Sango Jobs, three karmic uh, attaining to Buddhahood. Another one is uh, uh, pure and uh, sutra like uh, Ojo Jobutsu. We are so, uh, what should I say, uh, degenerated, so very difficult to attain Buddhahood in this time of, of the uh, period. 
But、uh, after life, the Amitabha Buddha will save you. So that is、uh, Ojo Jobutsu. And the last three,、uh, Sokshin Jobutsu.、Uh, spontaneously, everyone can become a Buddha, like a Buddha、uh, got enlightenment and as a body tree. So, like a Dogen style in the、uh, middle period of、uh, Japan、uh, period,、uh, he sit. Uh, insisted the sitting meditation is very important.、Uh, and also in the Heian period,、uh, about 1200 years ago in Japan,、uh, Kukai and Saicho, those uh, uh, people, they insisted、uh, Sokshin Jobs,、uh, spontaneous enlightenment by.、Uh, Practicing you know, some mantra, etc. So that is uh, uh, came into mind uh, after hearing uh, today's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sensei.